I want to welcome everybody this morning on a Saturday morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, uh, to Quick Shot Podiatric Dermatology. Uh, it's powered by LER Expo. And I want to give a big thanks act to, out to uh, Baco DX for their unrestricted educational grant for this okay. event. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lerman. Uh, Dr. Lerman's a podiatrist, certified professional coder, and certified medical auditor, professional medical auditor, that is. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Lerman. Thank you, Rich. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. How can we have a more productive practice? How can we have a more efficient practice? How can we have a practice that better serves our communities and allows us to better manage our risk? The answer to all of those questions is do more biopsies. Or for those that aren't doing any at all, start performing biopsies in our practices. A biopsy is typically a fast, easy, safe procedure that allows us to better serve our patients, have a more productive, efficient practice, and better manage our risk. This first session will focus on the importance of biopsies, the biopsies that we most commonly perform, and the CPT coding considerations that accompany the performance of biopsies. In this first talk, we are going to share CPT codes. And anytime CPT codes are shared, we must provide the reference that CPT is a registered trademark of the American Medical Association with all rights reserved by the American Medical Association. Like Rich said at the beginning, my plan is to try to go for like 40, 45 minutes here, leaving the last 15 minutes for Q&A. We hope you'll feel comfortable participating in the Q&A. Uh, if a question comes up as we go through this, please write it down and save it to the end. We, we want to fill that last 15 minutes with Q&A. With that introduction of the importance of doing biopsies, these guys don't want us doing biopsies. Look at these characters. Look what's on their website there. Fighting on behalf of misdiagnosed skin cancer victims. This is a very compelling website, right? That's advertised on daytime television for our patients to see. And look, look at their URL there in the bottom. They have the word skin cancer in their URL. This is a very real fear. We have too many colleagues, too many friends on the wrong end of medical malpractice suits as a result of not doing a thorough skin exam, as a result of not biopsying something that didn't look right. And here's just an example. This is American Journal of Surgery, peer-reviewed literature, looking at about 100 jury verdicts where 50% of the time, the allegation was that a biopsy wasn't even performed. This is a lesson that I hope you take away from this. If, if this is something that isn't already on your radar, something I hope you'll take from this and implement into your practice. And that lesson of we can actually have a more productive practice, a more fulfilling practice, if we slow down and see just a couple fewer people every day and spend more time with the people that we are with. Instead of running from room to room and being in a race to see as many people as we possibly can every day, instead see a couple fewer people and spend more time in the room we're already in. The lesson here is we walk in a room, do the introduction, say hello, update the history, and let's say we spend 15 minutes in that room. We are better served instead of running out of that room to start all over next door and spend 15 minutes in there. We are better served staying in the room we're already in and spending 10 more minutes in that room. So you may ask, well, what am I supposed to do with these 10 extra minutes? And one of the things that can be so fulfilling and so important is to perform a more thorough, for those of you that are lower extremity specialists, which I know most of us are on here, a more thorough lower extremity skin exam. 
And this, we're, this is not all podiatry on here this morning. So whatever your scope of practice is, a more thorough skin exam. You will find things. This is something I implemented into my practice a long time ago after I admit not doing it. You will find stuff. And most of the time, you'll find it's something the patient knew about. And oftentimes, it had been in the back of their mind for years and either didn't want to ask or didn't know who to ask or didn't know that you're the doctor that can actually get to the bottom of it. Or maybe they were embarrassed to ask. And I found that most of the time when we find something and then asks the patient, how long has that been there? Or were you aware of that? Normally, their eyes light up and they say, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. Or I didn't know I could ask you about that. And oftentimes, that thing that we found warrants a biopsy. And now we have a more productive visit. We've gotten more out of that visit. We've provided better care to the patient. We have a more satisfied patient and a more rich patient experience. And that's better by spending 10 more minutes in there than running next door to start over and spend 15 minutes in there. This is a lesson I learned from uh, my friend, Dr. Jonathan Moore, who I'm sure many of you know, and speaking to an audience of podiatrists. And if you're not podiatry, you could cross this over to your specialty. And he said, how many of you actually take the time to roll up your patient's pant legs and really lift up the leg and look under there and look at the back of the ankle, the back of the heel, both sides of the ankle, the back and posterior aspect of the calf. There's tons of pathology there that you will find if you're not already doing this. And all of that comes back to the risk management side of this. Because in this scary first slide or two, but it's real, in many cases where we see colleagues, friends go down, this is a patient that has been coming for years. And in the podiatry world, oftentimes it's every two months or every th three months for maybe diabetic, diabetic at-risk foot exam or covered routine foot care, where the patients come in every two or three months. And in many cases, the podiatrist has not been performing a thorough lower extremity skin exam. And maybe the patient just gets their toenails cut. But the EHR, in many cases, pre-populates the note with something about a skin exam that revealed no lesions or growths or areas of discoloration. Yet all the while, visit after visit after visit for years, there's something going on on the back of the calf that we missed and didn't see. And then they go to somewhere else, maybe dermatologist who finds it. And now we have notes every two months for the last 10 years that says we looked at the skin of their lower extremity and didn't find anything worthy of concern or worthy of biopsy. So again, this right off the bat here, it, you know, anytime you attend something like this, it's only natural to think, what am I going to get out of this? Why am I going to? I hope that lesson is something you take from this because it can, again, allow us to provide better care, have a more fulfilling, productive practice, and better serve our communities and better manage our risk. So if that was compelling enough to lead you to perform more biopsies or start performing biopsies, let's now go through the most common biopsies performed in the office setting and the appropriate CPT coding considerations that accompany each. Punch biopsy is the most common, super easy, fast. This is like a 30 to 60 second deal. Local anesthetic with epinephrine under the lesion, most of the time. Raise a wheel that takes seconds, right? This nifty punch needle allows us to go right in, twist. Typically, I find if you go, and I know many watching this already know this, 45 degrees at each angle that breaks it free, makes it really easy to get out. I much prefer this instrument at the bottom, the one where you can depress to shoot out the specimen. Did not have great experience with the one on top, uh, trying to fish out the specimen. I found the one on the bottom to be much more user-friendly. And this is a very fast procedure. We get our specimen in the cup, send it off, 
and then we know exactly what we're dealing with. If you perform one punch biopsy anywhere on the body, anatomy doesn't matter. The appropriate CPT code is CPT 11104. And I'll say this one more time. Anytime CPT codes are shared, we must provide their reference, which is the American Medical Association CPT book. We're currently broadcasting this live in 2022. So the reference for these is the 2022 CPT book. CPT is a registered trademark of the AMA with all rights reserved by the AMA. I said that at the beginning, and we have that reference on all the CPT code slides. So one punch biopsy, CPT 11104. That's easy. What if we do more than one? There might be a situation where we have to perform more than one punch biopsy. Maybe it's two different things that need to be biopsied. Maybe, like in this picture, it's one large area where maybe over on this side, it's one color, but on the other side, it's a different color. And for whatever reason, it is medically necessary to sample both of those sites. If we perform multiple punches, there is an add-on code for each additional punch biopsy, and that is CPT-11105. That's each additional. We're going to do an example on the next slide. We always need the first code. This is a common error with add-on codes that I see too frequently where providers, when using an add-on code, they skip the first one and only submit the add-on code. That's no good. It's an add-on code. It must be added to the first code. So we always need the base code. We always need the first one. In this case, for that first punch, 11105. And then if we do more than one, in addition, we also list 11105, 11104 for the first one, 11105 for each additional. And the number of units of CPT 1105 is how many did we do beyond the first? So let's do an example of three. Let's say we perform three bunch biopsies on the same patient at the same setting. The approach, now we always need the first one, right? So the first line would be CPT 11104. That's the first one, but we did more than one. So also on the next line, we need CPT 11105. How many units of that do we submit? The number of units of the add-on code corresponds to how many did we do beyond one. So in this case, we did a total of three. That's two more than one. So two units of that add-on code. When it comes to this add-on code with biopsies, people often ask, does it have to be contralateral? No, it doesn't matter left or right. It doesn't even matter part of the body. If we have one on the right forearm here and another one on the right forearm there, that's two different punches. In the picture here, it could be from the same lesion, the same area. If it's two different punches, then we get to submit multiple coding. Body part, laterality, doesn't matter. We may also have the situation where a shave biopsy is more appropriate. Shave biopsies are typically more appropriate for a raised lesion, something that's coming off the surface. This is not a shave removal. We're going to get to that. That's a, another common error. This is not a shave removal. This is a biopsy. This is, we don't like the way that looks. That's concerning me. We need to find out what it is. We're going to biopsy it. And because it's raised, we're going to perform that biopsy by shaving it. Shave biopsy. This is not, we're going to cut that thing out for you, right? This is a biopsy. And one way to perform a shave biopsy, same thing, typically local anesthetic with epinephrine, raise a wheel. This is also a 30 to second, 60 second procedure for most of us. You, you get efficient with these and get good office staff trained on these and say, we're going to do a biopsy in room two. And the staff sets it up for you with the syringe, with the local and the instrument that you're going to use and the specimen cup. This can be really a 20 to 30 second deal. Local, shave, in the cup, right? And I should have said, I'm going to go back because I wanted to say this with the punch biopsy technique. 
This typically doesn't even need a suture. If you're using a two millimeter punch, for example, which is typically fine for what we're doing, that doesn't even need a suture. Patient walks out with triple antibiotic ointment and a Band-Aid and you're done. I thought of that because I went through what's laid out on the tray for us, right? Local instrument specimen cup, and then we need what we're going to put on it. And the same is true for these shave biopsies. Patient typically walks out with antibiotic ointment and a Band-Aid. Such a simple procedure. And this also can be done very quickly. Here's one example of how to do it. We don't have to use these fancy shave instruments, but we can. They're cool. They're fun. These bendy shave blades where we can bend it, swipe uh, under that raised lesion and get that shave biopsy, which again is preferred over the punch typically if it's a raised lesion. And now let's go through the coding for this. If we perform a shave biopsy, the appropriate code is CPT11102. You'll see it's not only shave, actually, it's any type of tangential biopsy. In the code descriptor, they give us examples. One shave biopsy, CPT11102. And then just like the punch situation, there's an add-on code if we do more than one shave. We went through that maybe in too much detail with the punch, so we won't do it again here. It's all the same rules. Add-on code, you always need the first one. The number of units of the add-on code corresponds with the number of units beyond the first. And could have said this the first time with the punch biopsies. Hopefully, if you're watching this, you know add-on codes by nature never take 59, 51, or X modifiers. We also might have a situation where it's appropriate to perform an incisional biopsy doing this, something like an ellipse where we incise and cut out part of the lesion. So this is not a punch. This is not a shave. This is also not an excision, right? Excision is cutting the whole thing out. Incision is cutting part of the thing out. So if we perform an incisional biopsy, we have the same deal with a CPT code for incisional biopsy, CPT 11106. And if we perform more than one, there is also an add-on code for each additional incisional biopsy with all of the same guidelines applying to that add-on code that apply to the others that we talked about. We talked about the CPT codes for these biopsies. It's only natural to ask, well, what diagnosis code should I point to that CPT code? The guidance on this, now a lot of people don't like this, and I'm going to give you an alternative if you don't like it. I actually don't like doing it this way, to keep it real. However, the guidance is to actually wait and not submit the claim until we get the result. Because when we get the pathology result, then we know what it is, right? So if we get a pathology result that says this is diagnosis X, then we know to use that diagnosis code. Guessing is not recommended. Guessing on the diagnosis code is not recommended. I'm going to give you another option for those that say, I don't want to wait. That gets sloppy, especially if I'm doing a bunch of these. And again, I'll keep it real. Even though that's the suggested way to do it, I don't do it that myself in my own practice. I'll share the other option. But if you're willing to wait and you're more patient than I am and you get that result, here are some diagnosis code options. If it turns out to be a benign lesion of some kind, you might be choosing from this list. If it's a melanocytic nevi, we have a code for that. Carcinoma in situ, we have a code for that. And then this is a good opportunity to discuss other diagnosis codes. ICD-10 codes that include the word other. Other means I know what it is. I documented what it is. I specified what it is. But when I look at these options, you didn't give me the one I'm looking for. So let's say you get the pathology report back. You have a diagnosis. You know exactly what this thing is. And then you go and look through the ICD-10 codes, and there's no code that lists that diagnosis. 
that's a situation where it is appropriate to use other. Uh, I'll give an example for, for those that are lower extremity providers. A really common example, actually, deals with lateral ankle sprains. So we know when you look at the lateral ankle sprain diagnosis options, we have CFL sprain and then other sprain of the lateral ankle. And that's it. Those are the other, only two options, which doesn't make sense because that's not even the most common one, right? So what if we have an MRI and we know that this is only an ATFL sprain? That's a situation where it's appropriate to use other because they didn't give us that one as an option. So if we get the PATH report back and it's benign, but it's not one of the things listed in the ICD-10 code set, that's where it's appropriate to use other benign neoplasm. Please note that when I list these diagnosis codes, if there is a hyphen at the end, if there's a dash at the end, that means that the code is not complete and that additional characters are required. I'm going to repeat that. If the code is not complete and additional characters are required in my slides, there's a hyphen at the end. There's a dash at the end indicating that more characters are required to complete the code. I didn't want to fill up the slides with left and right and all that. So I think I made that clear. I put it in red. I put it in bold. I don't want anyone to mistake uh, that, that any of these are complete codes. If it comes back as malignant, we have malignant melanoma of the lower extremity and then melanoma in situ of the lower extremity. That's anywhere on the lower extremity, yes, including the foot. If it happens to come back as Kaposi sarcoma, that gets its own ICD-10 code, which I've listed here. Something I should have said at the beginning, uh, Rich from LER shared that the slides are available. Oftentimes people ask, can I get the slides? I think it makes for a not entertaining webinar to rattle off these diagnosis codes and have me read them to you. Uh, also no fun to try to write them down or take pictures of the screen, which of course you're welcome to if you want, but uh, we, we're, we're happy to share, I'm happy to share my slides. Uh, if you want them in Rich Shared, you can get them through him and his company. Uh, if none of those that we just talked about fit, we have this final option of other, right? The, the, there was no more specific ICD-10 code that fit. This is an other disorder of the skin. That code's an option as well. Now, I promise an option for those that don't want to wait, right? We said, wait for the pathology, then submit the codes, because then you know what the diagnosis is. If you want to submit it today, and this is how I do it, we have the option of D as in dog, D49.2, which indicates this is a neoplasm that I don't know what it is right? And this, again, I'll say guessing is not recommended. No matter how much we think we know what it is, we can't know for sure until we get the specimen back. So if you don't want to wait and you want to submit it today, and we don't know because it's impossible to know for sure, D49.2 indicates this is a neoplasm that I don't know what it's doing. I don't know what it is. And that's why I'm performing the biopsy. And that's an option as well. Another biopsy type is aspiration. This is very commonly performed by lower extremity specialists, podiatrists, uh, for sure. Uh, I know the whole audience is podiatrists here, uh, but very commonly performed by podiatrists makes up the, the majority of our audience this morning. Aspiration, of course, stick a needle in something, pull back the syringe and pull out the guts of the thing that we are aspirating, right? So, uh, this is, of course, not epithelial tissue, not skeletal tissue. We stick the needle in, pull the stuff out. That's an aspiration. Very commonly performed by ganglions. Ganglions cannot be definitively diagnosed by looking at them. This is a, an error made too frequently by our colleagues. Oh, that's a ganglion. Aspirate it squirt the stuff in the biohazard bag, and that's it, and not send it for pathologic evaluation is bad. That is bad care 
that's not serving our patients, that's not serving our communities, and it's putting us at tremendous risk. We stick a needle in something and pull the stuff out, it should be sent. Check out this last bullet point here. Of all soft tissue sarcomas, that's a scary word, right? All soft tissue sarcomas, more than half, this is peer reviewed literature, more than half were initially misdiagnosed as a ganglion. So a patient ends up with a soft tissue sarcoma and 50%, actually more than 50% of the time, another doctor on the first round said, oh, that's a ganglion and maybe didn't send it. So here's a scary story. This is published. Patient had a growth, dorsal aspect of their foot, went to a podiatrist. Podiatrist looked at it, said it was a ganglion, aspirated it, injected it with steroid, and didn't send what they aspirated. It came back. That happens, right? If it is a ganglion, patient comes back a year later and says, oh, this thing is back. That happens to ganglions also happens to things that aren't ganglions. No biopsy performed. Now the podiatrist said, all right, it came back. Instead of doing that again, let's cut it out. Now it takes a while to get a surgery set up, right? Scheduling, consent, whatever. Procedure actually happens two months later. So now we're 14 months out from the first visit. And now it goes to the pathology lab because for some reason, when we're in the operating, we're really good about that. And unfortunately, not always as good about that in the office setting. It got cut out in the operating room. It got sent to pathology. Turned out to be high-grade myxoid chondrosarcoma had already metastasized at that point. And in less than one year, this patient died. This is a terrible story, which likely occurred because that first visit, when the ganglion was aspirated, the contents were not sent. This did not go well in court. You may not be surprised to learn that the plaintiffs found an expert to say that if we found this 14 months earlier, survival rate is very good. However, by the time it had metastasized to the lungs, treatment attempts would have been futile. So we should be sending the contents of things that we aspirate. And aspiration is easy, right? This is this is not a complicated thing. Needle on a syringe, we stick the needle in, pull it out, aspirate the contents of that. And that is an aspiration of a cyst, right? That is an aspiration of a cyst. If it's an aspiration of something else, we have different code for that. But if it's a cyst and it turns out to be a cyst, CPT 20612, represents the aspiration that I just described. Stick the needle in, pull on the back range. What about a fine needle aspiration? What's the difference between what I just described, which I might think of as a regular aspiration, right? Or a plain aspiration. What's the difference between that regular aspiration and a fine needle aspiration? Well, let's look closely at what a fine needle aspiration is. And we're doing this for two reasons. One is there are people watching this who actually are performing fine needle aspirations. Another is there are people that are doing the regular aspiration that we just described and using the wrong coding, using fine needle aspiration when that's not what we actually did. So how do we differentiate between the two? I think most of us, the majority of the time, when it's a cyst that turns out to be a ganglion, looks like a ganglion, I think it's fair to say we're doing what I described. Needle on a syringe, stick the needle in, pull back on the syringe. What's the difference? So this is from peer-reviewed literature. A fine needle aspiration uses a thin, hollow needle to obtain... A, now, that's, all right, so far, so good. We're using a hollow needle, right? To obtain a sampling of cells. All right, now that starts to sound like cancer stuff, but let's see. Technically, there's cells in what we're pulling out of there for cytology exam or histological examination. Okay, we're doing histo, we're there, but we're not done. And this is where I fear colleagues make an error by not reading the whole thing. Fine needle aspiration is a sampling that cannot otherwise be performed with a standard 
diagnostic technique. I'm going to repeat that. A fine needle aspiration is done when we can't get it done by a standard diagnostic technique. Sticking a needle on a syringe in and pulling back on the syringe to aspirate something is without question a standard diagnostic technique. So fine needle aspiration only occurs when we couldn't get it done by something more standard. When you review peer-reviewed literature, and I'm about to show you, I did a ridiculous exercise on this regarding fine needle aspiration. What you find is that examples of fine needle aspiration are things on this slide. Not only these things, but these are really common examples. And finally, not that this 100% dictates the coding, but I think it's pertinent. I went to PubMed and searched fine needle aspiration. And yes, I went through the first 1,000 hits. It, it, you, you can show more on the screen than what's here, so it was, it's not as impressive as I'm making it sound. However, the first 1,000 matches, there are zero mentions of a ganglion. Zero. I think that counts, right? That tells us something about fine needle aspiration and ganglions. So we covered the CPT code for aspirating a ganglion cyst. We did that already. And let's go back, maybe the first time around, maybe you're more compelled to get this one after going through that. Again, aspiration of a ganglion cyst, CPT 20612. Now, there are people watching this who are actually legitimately performing fine needle aspirations. And if you do, the CPT code for that is CPT10021. This also has the add-on deal for each additional with the same setup as we went through in the beginning. This is fine needle aspiration without imaging. We also have codes for fine needle aspiration with ultrasound guidance. So especially with fine needle aspiration, it may be medically necessary to locate the thing that we are aspirating, right? And it might be a medically necessary to use ultrasound. So different set of codes, fine needle aspiration with ultrasound is another common question in coding. I did the procedure and I used ultrasound. Can I submit the codes for both? The answer to that is actually pretty easy. You ask, find the code that represents the procedure that you did and does it have an option of with ultrasound if it does like what we're looking at here right if there is a code that describes what we did with ultrasound we use that only because that includes both if you look through the cpt codes and you find what you did and it does not have an option of with ultrasound then we can submit both same as we went through before we covered the cpt codes now what are the diagnosis codes this is the same recommendation ideally wait until you get it back then you know what it is don't guess if you do get the results and it is one of the things on the left hand side of this slide of course use that diagnosis if you want to send the day that you do it we have this this is this is still soft tissue right? This is still an example of soft tissue. It doesn't have to be bone or skin. It's a neoplasm. It's soft tissue. And we don't know what it is. It has um, its behavior that I can't specify, right? We don't know yet. D as in dog, D49.2 to submit that day. And then we come to one of the most commonly inappropriately used codes by all lower extremity providers. This is not just a podiatry thing. Dermatologists get this wrong. PAs and NPs who treat the lower extremity get this wrong. Generalists who perform procedures on the lower extremity get this wrong. This is a very commonly inappropriately used code. And in doing what I do, getting to look at a lot of our colleagues' charts, most of the time it is seemingly not with intent. It's just because they don't understand the coding. CPT 1130X, and I put the X there because that final character speaks to the size 
which I didn't want to fill up the slide with a whole bunch of things. These shaving codes represent removal. That's the key word. This is straight from the CPT book. This is nobody's opinion. This isn't what anybody thinks. This is straight from the CPT book. It tells us the shaving codes are for removing a lesion, not a biopsy, not a sample, not a reduction, not just paring to make it thinner, removing. And where some colleagues get into trouble, oh, and I should have said, because this is also really important, local anesthesia is expected. Local anesthesia is expected. Now, where some colleagues get into trouble with this is a patient has erased something like a callus, perhaps, right? And the provider uses a scalpel to shave that callus, reducing the bulk of the callus. Now, what happens to calluses? They come back most of the time, right? So now two or three months later, patient comes back, they have a callus that needs to be shaved. We are not in that example performing a removal, right? If it's removed, it's not supposed to come back. It might, that happens. It's not supposed to come back every two months over and over and over and over and over. So the fact that we are shaving something alone does not warrant use of this code. We have to read everything that surrounds the code in the code book. And the CPT book makes it clear Local anesthesia is expected, and this is a removal. So this is cutting something out and removing it by shaving. Not necessarily a full thickness excision with an ellipse, but by shaving something. So what does that mean? Because now, if I'm listening to this for the first time, I think, well, where does, where does that leave us, right? If you're telling me it's a removal, yet it's not an excision, with an ellipse, what does that mean? This is a shave removal. Epidermis and or dermis it doesn't have to be the fancy bendy blade. It can also be a scalpel. And look at the, it's kind of three different images there. Look at the one in the middle. The whole thing has been removed. And we removed it by shaving the area. This clearly needs local anesthetic unless the patient has profound neuropathy. This needs local, right? We're not doing this on a sensate patient. Local anesthetic, shave to remove. We've removed the whole thing. That's where we use these 113 codes. Contrasted with pairing, P-A-R, pairing, right? These codes are used with routine foot care where the patient qualifies for this service when they have a qualifying diagnosis and class findings. I think the majority of our viewers or all are very comfortable with that. This is the reduction in the thickness of a lesion. This is not a removal. So important to contrast those two. Now, what if we do actually excise something? and cut something up. So now we're, we're ending with this, and I'm gonna remind the viewers, we're leaving 15 minutes or so at the end here for Q&A, and we hope you'll feel comfortable participating in the Q&A and submit questions. Rich even said you can raise your hand, come on live and talk, which would be cool. Now we're at the end, right? We've done the biopsy, we found out what it is, and it needs to come out. If it is a benign lesion, and we excise it, right? This again, I keep using the example of an ellipse because that's the most common way we excise something of the skin. We have these excision codes, CPT114 codes. I didn't fill them all in because there's a whole bunch of codes that change by diameter. And we also have one set of codes for lower extremity specialists, one set of codes for foot, and one set of codes for the ankle or leg. If you perform this excision, the code selection is based on the diameter, and we'll go through that in a moment. Local anesthesia was expected. If we have to perform simple closure, and simple closure is end-to-end -end simple sutures only. I'll say that again. End-to-end -end simple closure of the skin only, that's included. We don't get to separately code for that. However, 
if we have to perform intermediate or complex closure, that can be separately reported. That's a good thing. Oftentimes with the coding talks, we're talking about what we can't do, what we might be doing too much of, and it's not always fun. Here's one where colleagues are too often leaving this one out. So I'm going to repeat, if excision is performed and intermediate or complex closure is necessary, we can submit that intermediate or complex closure code in addition to our excision code. And I said that when you go through the list of all of these codes, they differ based on diameter. What's the diameter? Is the diameter the diameter of the thing itself? Or is it everything that we cut out, including margin? Because depending on what we're dealing with, we're gonna have different size of margins, right? It might be a two millimeter margin, five millimeter margin, sometimes even bigger. The diameter is measured from the entire thing cut out, including the margins. I'm going to repeat that. I'll say it differently, though. When determining the code, we need to use the diameter. And when determining the diameter, it is not the measurement of the lesion. It is measuring the diameter of what is removed, including the margins. So those are our codes for excising a benign lesion. We also have codes for excising a malignant lesion. And this is exactly the same. Everything parallels what we just talked about. No difference here. It's just, we did a biopsy, we found out what it is, it's malignant and we're cutting it out. All the same thing about simple closure versus intermediate or complex closure, local anesthesia, and you determine the diameter by measuring the whole thing, including the margins. We will finish up with destruction codes we might find it necessary to destroy a lesion so we have cpt codes in the destruction section what is destruction from a coding perspective this is ablating the lesion this is doing something to perform an ablation local anesthesia is expected if after the ablation we scoop out what we destroyed that's included. That's another common error. People report the destruction and some form of debridement or something for scooping out what we destroyed. No good. CPT tells us that curetment is included. So what is ablation? For those that need the clarification on this, this is not all inclusive. It doesn't have to be one of these, but some examples are listed on this slide. These are examples of ablation. What pathology types might require ablation? Destruction may be necessary for any of the ones listed here. A lot of us are doing this for warts. That's just an example. This is also not all inclusive. These are just examples. And then let's look at these destruction codes. If destruction is performed for a pre malignant lesion, you know that this is pre malignant. An example of that would be actinic keratosis. We have a CPT code for the first one. And then here's our add-on code. Any number two through 14 is represented by the add-on code here. Now this is different from our biopsy codes, right? For the biopsy code, there was a code for the first one. And then the add-on code was for each additional. So if we were doing three, we had multiple units there. Here, this isn't fair, I don't think, but this is how it works. If we do a second, or a seventh, or a ninth, all of those are represented by that one single add-on code. It's two through 14. What if we end up doing 15 or more? One, seven, zero, zero, four represents 15 or more lesions being destroyed. That was for pre-malignant. We also have vascular proliferative lesions. These codes are determined by the size right? And this is the, the same deal. It's the, the area destroyed, determines the coding, vascular proliferative region, lesions. I'm going faster, so we leave time for Q&A. And then finally, this is the one uh, used most commonly, I think, by this audience. This is a benign lesion that's not a skin tag, like a wart. So it's benign. It's not a skin tag. It's not a cutaneous vascular proliferation. Warts are really good examples. If we do one through 14, 
one code, 17110. Also not fair. I don't think. If you do one or you do 12, we get the same code. Doesn't seem right to me. If we do 15 or more, CPT 17111. So if we do 17 of these, we submit one code because we did 15 or more, 17111. And finally, we have the option for destruction of a malignant lesion. If it's malignant and we're going to destroy it via ablation, those codes are listed here. All right, we came close to the 15 minutes of promised Q&A. Thank you so much for your attention. And we will welcome back in Rich to moderate our Q&A session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lerman. Uh, extremely comprehensive, getting really positive feedback. Questions have been coming in. So I'm going to I'm going to go back to the first one. Uh, Dr. Holt, uh, which pays more, CPT 11104 or 11102? <laughs> uh, I don't have that memorized. And because this is an accredited program, we'll stay away from that. But I will share, it is totally fine to share, that our fee schedules are free and online and publicly available. It reads like a menu of CPT codes and payment amounts. So find out who your Medicare contractor is, right? Let's use an example. If we're in New York and your Medicare contractor is NGS, if you do a Google search for NGS Part B Physician Fee Schedule, it's super easy. It's right there. And you can find all those answers there. That's the Medicare fee schedule. Non-Medicare payers may differ, but that gives you a really good idea. Exactly. All right. Um, how do you recommend send collecting a needle aspiration in a safe and effective manner? So the question was best technique for fine needle aspiration. We, we, I, I hope, I think we made clear the difference between fine needle aspiration and regular aspiration. It's pretty simple, right? Once you get it in the needle, squirt it into specimen cup, send it to the lab. If 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 it's so, and then uh, you need to know whether to put it in a cup with a preservative or without. If it is if if we're looking for identifying an organism, right, like growing fungus or something, then of course we don't want preservative in there. If that's not the case, and we just want to identify the tissue type, then preservative is appropriate. Okay. Um, and uh, a doctor uh, questioned. Um, I never had a signed consent when a dermatologist did a shave biopsy on me. Is a consent form necessary? So the, I suggest you ask your risk management provider. I'm going to give an answer. It's a little bit of a cop out because I'm not totally comfortable answering because it might even differ by state. Your risk management provider wants to answer your med mal carrier. They want to answer that for you. They want you to ask those questions. The safest bet is to always do it. The safest bet, if you do it, you can't lose. There is no umbrella rule that applies to every provider everywhere in the country that answers that question. It might differ by state. The best bet on that is to ask your med mal carrier. They love those questions. They're mm -hmm. probably going to say yes. Yeah, paperwork's always better, right? <laughs> Have that paper trail. Um, do you uh, do an aspiration before ordering an MRI or uh, concomit concomitantly? <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those words. So the question was, if we're looking at something and we're not sure what it is, would you perform an aspiration before ordering an MRI? It depends, right? It depends how worried you are about it, how likely you think you are it is to go to surgery. I see no harm in starting the aspiration, right? The MRI is very likely not going to diagnose the problem. The MRI is more useful in locating it, determining the size, determining the depth, and helping to guide procedures, right? It helps with surgical planning. It helps, oh, can I get this out in the office or am I going to find a surprise under there? So typically safe to start with an aspiration to confirm diagnosis, and then MRI might be more appropriate for planning procedures, determining extent, things like that. So I guess I talked myself in to the answer. I typically would do aspiration before MRI and not do them together. But there might be situations where it's important to do both at the same time. Cool. Um, uh, Dr. Tavik, uh, fine needle aspiration used when ganglion cyst contents no longer able to be aspirated? Question. Sounds more like a statement. Fine needle aspiration used when ganglion cyst 
contents are no longer able to be aspirated? That it that might be the case, right? So, however, that alone does not define the distinction, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat what it was, just peer reviewed literature dictating this. Fine needle aspiration is is when more what was the word that I used from that slide? Routine? I can't remember. But but whatever word I said, right? When a regular biopsy, when a regular aspiration isn't going to get it done and we are aspirating cells. Remember that was in the thing too, right? Aspirating cells for cytology or histology. And that may be appropriate when we can't get whatever we're trying to get with what we're doing. That may be the case, but that alone does not define the distinction. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Barnes, uh, what is the best procedure if uh, she suspects melanoma? So biopsy, right? So you said suspect. So if you look at something and you don't, you're concerned about it, biopsy first. Mm -hmm. If it is raised, a shave may be more appropriate. If it is not raised, a punch may be more appropriate. And once confirmed, that's excision with appropriate referrals, of course. Quickly. Yeah. Uh, two questions, uh, Dr. Carpati. Uh, we have a will when sending in a hypergranulation tissue from nail fold during nail procedure, can it, can um, she code a biopsy or will it be bundled with the nail procedure? That's one. And number two, if we send it in, do we code as an incisional? No. And okay. yes, it will be bundled. The question was hypergranulation tissue, proud flesh, whatever you want to call it, in the nail groove at the same time as a nail avulsion, partial matrix, whatever, can that be separately coded? It cannot, and whether we think it's fair or not is a different story. It is bundled, it is included in the service, it is not separately reportable. Still smart to send if you think it's appropriate, but we can't report it. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Goodman, uh, if a patient has a recurring painful punctate keratosis, um, would you just perform a punch biopsy to remove it? So first, bravo on using the correct terminology there. Oftentimes we see providers using weird terms for those that they aren't correct or appropriate. So might we use a punch to remove one of those? Sure. If you have an appropriate size punch that's going to get the full diameter of that thing, local anesthetic and a removal, absolutely. Now, this is, this is I'm going to take it to coding. So the answer to the question is yes. You absolutely can get those out using a punch if it's the right size. And oftentimes it's a niftier, cleaner way to do it than excision and curette. Do we use a punch biopsy code just because we used a punch? Not necessarily, right? The, the instrument does not necessarily determine the code because what we just described there, that's a removal. It's not a shave removal, right? That's an excision. So yes, we can use that instrument, but when doing it the way you described, the person who wrote that in, that would be an excision code. But the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Maglia. Uh, considering uh, curatage of ver Veruca under the local anesthetic with specimens submitted to the lab, excision, destruction, or shave? So this is curatage mm -hmm. under local anesthetic of a Veruca, of a Veruca. Did he say, at, there was nothing in there about destruction, right? No. In the, no. Well, so that's no, that's excision. an excision. Oh, yeah, excision. Okay. You're yeah, good. yeah. He, but he didn't say I'm, I'm performing destruction. It was just in no, the no, options. No. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an no. excision, right? Numb it up, scoop it out with a curette. That's an excision. I'll repeat, excisions are not something that are expected to be submitted week after week after week for the same thing, right? So if it's a wart and we numb it up and scoop it out, remove it with a curette, that is an excision of a benign lesion. Okay. Uh, Dr. Perry. Hey, Dr. Perry. He's been on many events. Good to see you here. Um, okay to use 17110 several times when the wart doesn't go away? Sure. Yeah. So the question was, is it appropriate to use CPT 17110 if, if it needs multiple 
destructions, right? So to repeat, mm -hmm. CPT 17110, destruction of a benign lesion. That's not a skin tag, not a cutaneous vascular proliferative lesion. We said this is commonly used with warts. Yes, it is appropriate. And we should be documenting why. So if we did this last week and we're doing it again this week, it is important to document the medical necessity of why it is being repeated. Awesome. Okay, so we have two more, two minutes, actually about one and a half minutes left. So I'm going to try to, if I can't get to all the questions, we'll make sure that we get them back to you, uh, Dr. Lerman, and you can uh, answer them um, um, after the event. Uh, so uh, Dr. Derriman, uh, when doing two two millimeter punches for dermatitis on the same foot, same area, as historically recommended by Bacotic, you stated you should use 11004 and 11005. In doing so, must these specimens be separated and sent individually labeled to qualify for both codes? No, they okay. do not. So the question was perform two punches, both in the same area. What if we put them both in the same specimen container? That's fine. The code does not speak to what we did after. The codes only describe what we did. So if two are performed, CPT code dictates 11104 for the first one, 11105 for the second one. Doesn't matter how many specimen cups they go in. Okay. This will be the last question, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, does the type of laser for destruction matter? No. Easy one. That's an easy question. Um, uh, we'll see. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. We're going to close that's why, out. Dr. That's Lerman. why I went fast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to close out of this session. And then uh, Dr. Jacobs will be in the next room. When I, when I stop sharing, we, when I stop streaming this session, we all want to go back to your dashboard and join the next session. We'll see you all in the next room. Thanks, Dr. Lerman. Great job. Have a good one.